understanding. So Bilbro, we don't do a uh, specific time bound for what? And we work with them in a customized way. So which means that the core value that we are actually adding, because it's customized, is mentoring. Both I would say from within the team as well as external experts. There are two specific types of mentors that we uh, bring uh, on board to work with our companies. Uh, the first type would be more a general business mentor. And uh, these business mentors, uh, typically we prefer that they are entrepreneurs, they have been entrepreneurs themselves, or at least entrepreneurs within large corporates where they've worked. Um, and uh, the, the core really what we're looking for is they, they understand how to build and grow a company. Right? And they can uh, relate to the entrepreneur, um, you know, and understand that entrepreneurial journey of the business. I think that's the way that connection can be. So that's the general business mentor. And the second type of mentor that we engage in is a sector or a functional expert. So I would say there are two different types. Uh, both the engagements are quite different. So for every company that is an incubator, we assign a business mentor who works for at least one year or at least a significantly longer period of time. So at least for six months, I would say would be a minimum. But most often it is one year. And that engagement is very intensive, very big expectation that we have of the mentors that they can spend at least eight days a month. Uh, with our right. eight days, which could be split over that month, but eight days is eight days into eight hours is what we say uh, as expectation setting from the mentor, which means that we are expecting them to engage very intensely with the companies, and that uh, engagement uh, is contracted. So we do actually put it down um, on a piece of paper, it's signed on to engage uh, with the company uh, contractually. The reason that we switched to this away from a pro bono mentoring, we did pro bono mentoring for many years, and the very, uh, you know, some very good lessons from that. One, where there was a natural chemistry between the mentor and the entrepreneur. Now, that chemistry could have been because of the specific expertise of the mentor, or it could have been that they just naturally hit it off, they had something in common. The value add was tremendous, where they actually had, you know, we could actually see the specific inputs that the mentors had in helping that company succeed. And they continue that engagement even when they were not involved. Two, but majority of our pro bono mentors, we saw that except for the time that we actually we force them to sit down together, it didn't really take off. Um, so we took a lot of lessons from that and we redesigned our mentoring engagement a few years ago. Um, and uh, that's when we came up with a structure incentivizing, which means that the mentors that we engage, we do pay them a small fee. Uh, so which could be, I would say, hundred to two hundred dollars a day. So which means in our incubation budget. And the reason that we did that is this money is not equal to what they are compensated in the market. It is, but it brings a certain responsibility and accountability to the engagement. Also, it puts the onus on us to select and match very well to the enterprise and ensure there is buying from the entrepreneur as well. The sector and functional experts actually work a little differently. That's very specific. So, for example, if there is a company that's really struggling to get sales and schools are their clients, then we may bring in a functional expert who actually will work with them just one of the ones really fixing that sales issue that they have. I just want to quickly tell you about how, you know, uh, where we get actually referrals is our most successful way of uh, recruiting mentors. Uh, we started when, you know, I think about four years ago, we kind of redesigned, as I was saying, mentoring program. And uh, when I started out doing that design, I think we had a few from our program mentoring who were actually very engaged and wanted to continue. So we took a lot of feedback and then designed a uh, mentoring engagement. And we spent a lot of efforts in actually building these relationships. And a lot of our other mentors, it was kind of a network effect. They brought in other people saying, hey, this is my friend, you know, I want to give back a few days uh, in the year, he wants to make it for that, right? Um, another key way has been actually putting out a call through some very strategic networks. So in India, for example, uh, Thai is a big uh, network of, you know, started by people who came back from Silicon Valley and wanted to give back, uh, supporting entrepreneur startups. So there, there are both angels and mentors, and that's a fantastic network. So we actually have partnered with them and we put our push out calls to say, hey, we're looking for mentors, come join us, have a conversation with us. And similarly to and the, um, another, in, another regional industry associations, especially you know, in, from different sectors, it's really been um, quite important for us. And of course, some of the times when we really want somebody very specific, we do go on to 
uh, you know, LinkedIn and see who in our networks um, and who in those sectors, who in those companies. So I think uh, we will get into what specific skills and all that later. I think I think a few lessons for me. I think when I you know first started engaging and trying to bring mentors on was really spending a lot of time understanding what they wanted, understanding the mentor's motivation for coming and joining us. And then actually spending a lot of time with our team to understand what specific needs were there to be on for now. And changing that shift for just matching for just the skills and expertise to really thinking about you know, who would really fit and motivate, aligning motivations and interests of both parties, um, I think has, uh, you know, and intentionally doing that definitely helped us. Um, and I think, you know, especially starting moving from pro bono to this incentivized mentoring. Uh, we did put a lot of effort into that relationship building and that matchmaking. And that I think uh, today I would say it's a very successful uh, initiative and it's really the core of the value that we are adding to our um, entrepreneurs. Um, I'll probably address some of these questions maybe as uh, we continue the discussion. So, how do you do the mentoring? What is your. And if you have specific questions, come down and we'll address them for yes. Priya as we go. So, uh, first of all, on Recent Institute, which is the former version of Uncharted, and we learned a lot about mentorship from people in this room. So Ian and Avery, and we you know, owe a lot of our work to, I want to just acknowledge that there are people who have been doing this for a long time and we've learned along the way um, from amazing, amazing folks. Uh, so when we started in 2009, um, there was a conference in the U.S. called SOCAP. Uh, this is an impact investing social entrepreneur conference, and two of the co-founders of our organization went to the conference and uh, they were asked at the conference to interview people who were attending the conference, um, sort of big wig folks who were part of the conference. And that was like, they were just, just getting going with our organization and they were asked to interview these folks. So they would go interview these um, mentors, experts in the field, entrepreneurs, investors, on behalf of SOCAP, they were paid to do that. And at the end of these interviews, they would say, oh, by the way, we're doing this thing, an accelerator, do you want a mentor, uh, do you want to be a mentor for our program? Yeah. So it's very much like, they kind of snuck it in at the last moment and said, do you want a mentor with us? And that is how the very, the very first mentors for Uncharted, then called the Reason One Institute, got going was sort of sneaking in the back door this ask. And I share all of that simply to say, you can find mentors anywhere. And oftentimes they will come from unlikely connections. If you're part of conferences, you can find them there. So when it comes to recruitment, um, we started with some very crumble beginnings. It wasn't like we had this major call, an announcement. It was very much a word of mouth experience. And I think um, we still grow our mentor network very organically. Um, and that is when it comes to recruitment, um, a very organic process. Mm -hmm. We then will identify specific mentors that we want to go after and we will pursue them and ask them to be a mentor. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes it's a process of us being turned down multiple times and keep going. So we have this famous story of uh, a mentor that we're trying to get locked up uh, named Chip Heath. There's a number of books in the U.S., a business author. And so every single year we would email him and say, Chip, we want you to be a mentor for our program. And every single year he would respond to our email and say no. And so we kept at it. And after yeah. seven years of emailing him, finally he was like, you have worn me down, I will be a mentor, and you can't be a mentor with us. So it's like, even if the first time you're trying to get an extraordinary mentor, it may take some time to get them. What I will say though, and no offense to Chip Keith, our very best mentors are not famous people that you've heard of. Our very best mentors are people who are willing to go deep with the entrepreneurs and support them long term. That oftentimes is correlated to or not correlated to somebody who's, who's famous. Um, quickly going over the selection for a second. We have a lot of amazing mentors and people who are really experienced in the work that they do and they have great titles. And you look at them and you say, wow, I want to be you when I grow up. And the entrepreneurs think the same way. And they are just bad mentors. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between somebody who's a good mentor and someone who's built a good business. Mm -hmm. So it's important to kind of tease that out a little bit because you can have a great face, a great name, but if they're not a good mentor, for actually coaching and developing somebody, that's a different skill set. 
So one of the questions I like to ask when we're recruiting mentors is, how do you, prospective mentor, develop your younger staff on your team? Do they have a thoughtful answer or response to how they are developing and coaching people on their team to grow and to become more successful? If they said, I don't know, I just, I just, I just <laughs> sit with them and I just lecture them for 30 minutes and that's how I deliver mentorship to them, that's perhaps not the way that we like to have mentors engage. If they say, oh, I have a very specific philosophy on how I'm developing and coaching younger staff, it looks like this. I, I, I want to create opportunities for them to find ownership, so I push them into the deep end, and then I do this next thing. Mm -hmm. And if they have a good answer to how they're coaching and developing younger staff, that's a really good way to evaluate are they going to be a good mentor. One of our very best mentors um, is this guy who comes uh, to, to work with our entrepreneurs. He shows up, he comes from DC, he comes to Colorado, uh, and he like immediately changes into like his basketball shorts and his tennis <laughs> shoes, and he'll show up at like 11 or 12 in the, in the middle of the day, and he'll say, okay, who's my first mentee? And we match them up, and they go, and he says, we're going to the bar, and they go to the bar for like four hours. And they just and he will sit there and just Socratically ask questions of the entrepreneur. And then at the very end, he's like, all right, leave me. And then he will not provide much advice. He will simply ask a series of questions to lead an entrepreneur to a place of them self-discovering the insight that he wants them to discover. And then they're like somewhat drunk, completely amazed. And, they come <laughs> down, uh, and so somewhat I'm sure. <laughs> But I think that that's the, the Socratic approach to mentorship is really is really something that we value. Um, what we don't like is a mentor. Dictionary that Socratic approach. Then how would you? Socratic is asking a series of questions to elicit responses um, that the person who's responding is kind of discovering and processing themselves via dialogue. So we're looking for mentors who are really going to coach and develop an entrepreneur, not just by lecturing them, and that's. Our personal approach, there are certain mentors who are great at lecturing, but we think that that type of engagement is valuable. So, a, a story about recruitment, a story about selection, about what we look for. What we have found, as I stepped in to manage our mentor network um, back in 2012, and what we, what we learned and some of the things that are here is like, we had extraordinary mentors who were engaging with entrepreneurs, but what we found is that there were very few long-lasting mentor-entrepreneur relationships. And uh, this morning we talked about smart cuts. And we're talking about, you know, like if you're, you're able to take a, a shortcut by finding somebody who can really help you get on your way. Um, and we were wondering why is it that our mentors and entrepreneurs are not engaging in long-lasting mentor relationships? Like, what's the issue here? They will come, they'll mentor for a couple of days at a time, but then why, why if, if mentorship is truly a game changer for entrepreneurs, and I think the theory of it being a smart cut is right, then we want to see not just one-off mentorship, we want to see long-lasting mentor relationships. And when we looked across our whole portfolio, we saw that it wasn't happening. And the question was, why wasn't mentorship actually converting to long-lasting engagement because if we i mean as an organization we really wanted to see transformation as i mentioned this morning a direction shifting trajectory of our ventures our thesis was that mentorship was a key piece of that but in fact mentorship wasn't an ongoing long-lasting thing so the question was why and i really wrestled with this for a couple of months and i sat down and talked to all of our mentors or a number of our mentors number of our entrepreneurs, what we discovered is that our mentorship problem was an entrepreneur problem. It wasn't that the mentors were dropping the ball, it was that the entrepreneurs were dropping the ball. And there's some, maybe underneath some of these questions is like, mentors are busy, they're not that available, so we have to make sure that whatever, we realized that actually the mentors who were super busy were actually quite available for the entrepreneurs. And it was the entrepreneurs that were not following up and really engaging with mentors. And what we discovered was that actually, perhaps, people don't know how to engage with mentors. Mm -hmm. It's a weird relationship. How many of you all have a professional or personal mentor that you engage with? So, maybe about two-thirds of the room. 
Um, I know I have a, I have one or two mentors, but it's not something for me that I have found naturally. I know how to do. It. I need some insight and practice and advice on how do I get the most out of the person that's mentoring me. So one of the things that we've learned over time is that we actually need to coach our entrepreneurs on how to get the most out of mentorship. And so our mentor problem was an entrepreneur engagement problem with mentors. And so we spend a lot of time right now in our program coaching entrepreneurs on how when they sit down with a mentor to capture all the brilliance of wisdom. And so the question was, what if we have an hour-long session or a four-hour session or a year-long engagement, what if we were able to get 20% more value out of that session, out of that relationship? That can be a really powerful thing. And what we found is that entrepreneurs just didn't know how to engage. We do a lot of entrepreneur coaching, we have to go into that more, on how you engage with mentors over time. Um, we have a network of about 200 mentors right now. Uh, on any given any given year, we engage about 75 of them, so not the full group. Uh, we select our entrepreneurs first, then we go out and find relevant mentors for them. We have some mentors who are broadly relevant who come in, but oftentimes we'll go out and recruit a specific mentor based on the needs of that entrepreneur. Uh, in my, we don't we don't pay our mentors, um, and we also don't sign contracts with our mentors. And one of the key things, and we have a very organic approach to mentorship, which I think has its downsides and its upsides. Um, and one of the things that we have learned is that the relationship between a mentor and an entrepreneur, it's going to sound obvious, is between a mentor and an entrepreneur. It's not a relationship between a mentor, an entrepreneur, and uncharted. We're not going to third wheel in that relationship. And so we don't want to tell a mentor, okay, you are committed to doing this thing for X amount of time. We, have, we don't have them sign contract. When I go to, a, if I sit down with a new mentor, I say, look, uh, the relationship between an entrepreneur and a mentor is very much based on chemistry. For the ability for you all to be in a long-lasting relationship is going to be based on how well you all get along. Not whether or not I think you all need to stay together for eight months or not. Same thing with the dating. You're not going to sit up your friend and say, no, no, you guys must go on ten dates. Like, <laughs> even if you don't like each other. And so, you haven't met my parents, but yes, go <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we actually are not prescriptive about it. And the invitation is, hey, come and meet our entrepreneur, date them, figure out how the chemistry works, and then it's between you all to structure a relationship going forward. Do you all need to be speaking on every Monday morning? Once a month? Once every six months? We don't know. That's up to you to determine your, um, your relationship with the entrepreneur. And then we tell the entrepreneur, you need to leave the relationships. And if there's one thing that you take from this session, at least from an entrepreneur's perspective, it is that Entrepreneurs need to leave the mentor entrepreneur relationship. The mentor will not leave that relationship. The entrepreneur needs to leave it. If entrepreneurs feel well equipped to leave the relationship, fine. If they do not feel well equipped to leave the relationship, then it's your job as the intermediary, as the accelerator, to equip them to be leaders in that one on one relationship. And so that's an important thing for us. The last thing I'll say, then we can keep chatting, yeah. um, is why do mentors engage? Why are mentors, and we, there's this power dynamic that we at least perceive, and it goes like this. Mentors are just like, it's so generous of you to give <laughs> your time to work with me, this lowly entrepreneur. And that is just not true. Sometimes I'll say, look, like, okay, right now, here's where an entrepreneur is. And here's where an entrepreneur wants to go. And the bridge between the current reality and the future that the entrepreneur wants, that bridge is something the mentor can help them tread. They can help them tread that bridge. And then the mentor is oftentimes the bridge to help them get to that next level. The mentors love this opportunity to help take an entrepreneur from small and experimental to big and impactful. They love, what you're telling to a mentor is you're saying, look, here's where an entrepreneur is, here's where they could go, 
you are the difference, you can actually help them get there, you can be the hero. And mentors love it. So we, we, as I mentioned, our engagement problem with mentors was not a mentor problem. It was an entrepreneur problem. And the mentors are delighted. We get way more mentor requests now um, than we can actually process and engage with because they want to be a part of it. Many of our mentors are entrepreneurs themselves. They just love working with early stage organizations, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs who are super coachable, who are willing to try things out, who are courageous. And so it's less about, I, mean, I guess one thing I just want to emphasize is that when you're engaging mentors, you're actually providing a service to them. Okay. Of having giving them a chance to insert themselves in this diagram and provide value. And so yes, they're being generous with their time, sure. But I think that there's real value to provide. You're giving them the chance to impart their wisdom in a powerful way to shift the trajectory of an early stage business, and that's really exciting. So I think that we've experimented with that. Um, I think just to say, you know, uh, this sort of tagging on to what Matt was saying about the long term relationship, that's absolutely integral to us. We see ourselves as only facilitating and adding value at the start. But what we've seen is because we've been intentional about how we match, those relationships are extending way beyond what we are saying, you know, you should actually, you know, uh, be in this engagement. And we're seeing that in two or three ways. We are actually reserving a certain part of the equity. Um, for as mentor equity. Uh, so then the part becomes part of that transaction that we have with the company. So that's one. In the ways that we're seeing the engagement go beyond um, is that where those, these relationships have become so strong is that the entrepreneurs are now actually creating roles for these mentors on their board or as advisors, as formal advisors in their companies. Um, and that is really only just the, uh, the answer to how good and how valuable that relation, mentor and entrepreneur relationship has been. Um, at the incubator level, uh, Paul, uh, you know, I think we experimented with it in the beginning where we said we reserve part of the equity of ours to give, you know, uh, say we were you know, negotiating for 10 percent, we reserve 2 percent. We tried that. How did that work? So, uh, your question was, how does the concept, I mean, how does it work? Does it play out well, right? If a mentor is, is provided equity. Yes, I think there's the good and the bad. Uh, in my mind, the good is now incentives are aligned. There is, it's not just the, the in incentive, but it makes both sides accountable because the entrepreneur now is giving away something and the mentor is getting something. So therefore, you are actually much more accountable and serious about it. It's not just pro bono, right? And I think therefore, it's more replicable to more different types of people as opposed to just getting the most committed, you know, people in it. So I think the it becomes the it becomes really a carrot. I think the flip side is when you're ex, when you have a stake in the company. Don't I'm not too sure whether you allow the entrepreneur to reflect really well uh, and reflect enough, thinking beyond that. You know uh, the equity that you hold and the success of that equity. You know, in some cases, it could well be that the entrepreneur should just close down. Now, if you have equity, and if all your effort is being rewarded through equity, you might still want to push the guy in a certain direction. If you're not working hard for it, he's working. So, I think that's the flip side. You don't really allow a good, rounded perspective and reflection to happen when things are not going well. So, that's the, the downside I see. The way that we do that, I think Vance addressed that how they do it. I think the way that we do it is that after we understand what the mentor, you know, mentor's motivations are. And, you know, in our portfolio, we know what the entrepreneur is. We actually, before any actual match, we allow them to have one or two conversations um, and actually see if that chemistry happens. Um, and many times, the entrepreneur comes back and has said to me, you have another option for me. And that to me <laughs> has given me the need to say, okay, something, you know, there was something wrong in that uh, discussion and then you try to go to understand what that was. And that allows you a better understanding. So allowing that the, the first day to happen, and very often people decide it as we do in life, <laughs> if the first day went well or not. And if they do want a second day, then you know, a second conversation to decide that's much, especially when you know the skills and expertise of the person they feel could really help them. But then you know something will go well. I think giving that opportunity uh, will certainly allow 
for at least for us to predict, you know, or to stop some of those failures from happening. Yes, sorry. So if you know them a little bit, then it's a little easier, yeah. in a sense, to match them with investees or um, companies you work with. Yeah. But for more, I would say, like, cold call type of yeah. um, mentors that you're trying to get, yeah. how much due diligence do you do? Sure. And what, ha- for you, has been most effective? Because it's different, right? Um, if you get feedback from friends or whatever, they'll say the best thing. But how do you balance the information that you gather as well? Uh, so there was a mentor who may not know that was not, but you know, there's some friend of friend. Yeah. But I've had a few where you know it's complete blank where I have actually gone on LinkedIn and searched, um, and then we tried to find a first is try to find if there's a you know any connection somebody does know this person. Two was actually having uh, multiple calls in really understanding. Uh, understanding their skill set, understanding their motivation, asking really probing questions. I think some of the things that you know, Banks mentioned, you know, I've asked those questions myself. Um, and then actually asking for some references. And of course, people only give the best and the most positive. Uh, but very often, that I, or something that I've done, I've actually seen on LinkedIn some of the companies that they've mentioned, and I've actually reached out to people and done some of those checks. Uh, but to be honest, reference checks, uh, you have to take with pinch of salt because people always say the nicest things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of the ways that I also see is how long it was engaged to stay out okay. uh, with these references to understand and you know have they had any rules. So trying to kind of judge um, and then also trying to understand their style um, you know, through discussions and questions. <laughs> what, what would you do if you have a mentor that you bring in? And the mentor, you think they're good, and they come in, they start mentoring an entrepreneur, and you, you don't need good feedback. Um, I have a perspective on, on how we come on this idea of attracting the impact and effectiveness of mentors. Entrepreneurs are, don't have much funding, but they do have time. We need to be good stewards of their time. So we can't just keep saying them crap mentors because they may have abundance of time, but they um, it's going to be quickly used up. So, how do we make sure that we're only delivering extraordinary mentors to our entrepreneurs? So, thoughts on how? I'm curious, and I have. I'll share some thoughts too. But how do you call a mentor network? How do you fire a mentor? Yeah. How do you maintain a level of quality in mentorship? <laughs> we have fired mentors with their as with impropriety. Uh, where whether it's on, on a gender dynamic that's inappropriate, um, then we quickly will uh, remediate that and, and, and fix that. Um, but the vague area where they're they're not being helpful. They're not being helpful. Not clear. So they come, they sit down, and they just want to hear themselves talk about how great their for, their past exploits have been in the business world, and they're not actually listening to what the entrepreneur needs. Your mentor network can continue to grow and grow and grow and get diluted in terms of the quality of mentorship. And if you are in the business of accelerating entrepreneurs, of de-risking them, of increasing their chance of success and scale, and if mentorship is a key dimension <coughs> of your value proposition to entrepreneurs, you've got to deliver great people to great people. And what we say sometimes when it comes to Uncharted is, we give the best people, our entrepreneurs, the best people, our members from the Not. I was going to talk about a practice to address this situation that we use, and I don't know whether that will be beneficial for the accelerators here. I think you touched upon it. Uh, uh, compete, take one, fire. Right? Uh, compete means really if your mentor is not doing well, can you introduce another mentor to share some of the responsibilities, and if that really works, now this guy is really, you know, worried about it, and so that's one way to handle it. Taper is is the simple way. Actually, you got to be nice, but the entrepreneur now because he's leading it, you really advise the entrepreneur to actually, you know, taper off, right? Because he's the entrepreneur is leading. And fire is really when you have this hard time when there are these hard calls to be made, where there's improper, uh, improper behaviors and things like that. We've had situations where we had to do the talking, but in most cases, I have had to do the talking, <laughs> not my junior portfolio manager, because that becomes very, very improper. And I think actually having a respectful conversation. So I would say compete, uh, taper, and fire. And I, I think at some point you have to take those calls for sure. If the relationship between 
a mentor and an entrepreneur is just between a mentor and an entrepreneur, then the accelerators, the intermediaries, our job is to container build. We build the container in which those relationships can happen. And for us, that means expectation setting around, okay, here's the expectation on the mentor side, here's the expectation on the entrepreneur side. So the mentor, hey, you're going to come, you're going to date, you're going to meet all these entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, you're going to lead the relationship. Leading the relationship also means ending the relationship when that time might be. But for us, when it comes to Uncharted, it's different for many of the program partners here. We take a very container building approach to this which means we're not part of that one-on-one -on -one relationship, so we need to do a good job of equipping people who are part of that one-on-one -on -one relationship to manage the vicissitudes of that relationship over time. So it's just a different approach based on a contract versus something like that. Quick question to Bilgar and Anchai. Do you get a sense of the percentage split on um, how much is personal development? Like, um, I've got anxiety right now as an entrepreneur, I'm not seeing my kid enough. Like, is there stuff around that? Or is that really strategic, which is like, you should partner that bank on these terms? Can we, can we get a sense of that? I think it's a reflection of the complexion of our mentor pool. There are some mentors who come in, we have an amazing mentor who is the chief culture officer at the Wikimedia Foundation, which runs Wikipedia. And she manages Wikipedia culture and the way that they think about talent. And she's a very empathic person. When you sit down with her, the conversation naturally gravitates towards like, how are you? <laughs> and, and she pulls that out of, of that mental relationship in really powerful ways. And then we have people who are very tactical about investments, about marketing strategy, whatever. And so when you are building out a pool of mentors, it's interesting to think about beyond the specific needs that the entrepreneur have, how do you have a pool of mentors that actually based on the chemistry that you might find between entrepreneurs and mentors, will pull out different things. Um, and so I think it really depends on the nature of those relationships. It's interesting to see that like, sometimes you think, okay, these, they're going to really jive on scale strategy, and they come back and say, oh man, we're both really good friends. They're like, that's, like, we're big into soccer, and like, we bonded over that, and we're going to get to scale later, but like, we've been talking about our families and our sports, and and so it's, you just don't know sometimes how it's going to play out. I think majority, probably like 60 to 70 percent is on the actual business itself. And then there is maybe a 30 percent more of like mentorship versus coaching. We also pair each entrepreneur with an executive coach whose focus is specifically on the internal psychology of the, each entrepreneur. So we'll delineate between our mentor network is 200 people or so. And then each entrepreneur will match with a professional coach whose job is specifically to care for their day-to-day -day lived experience as a leader of the business. I think my take on it is that I don't think you can ever divorce the two um, because ultimately you're dealing with people. Um, and so there will be that element of you know personal development and this coaching. In that mentoring engagement, then even as an instructor, you're saying that this is the only thing that you must talk about, it will never actually happen. So we need to be able to think about that. I think what we've seen is, and through the engagement, because when, when the engagement begins, we are kind of outlining kind of closely what you know what are the key challenges this business is facing, and that is what they're addressing. Uh, but I would say, you know, roughly that breakup where they, they do, because you know, when if an entrepreneur is going through a divorce. There's no way that that is not affecting their work and how they're engaging. Mm -hmm. Or if they don't have money to pay their employees this month and they need to take a personal gift, they need to take a personal loan, which his wife or her husband is not happy with. Those are things, you know, it's very, as a, especially the small growing companies, I think it's hard to. So I think they do address that. An interesting thing that, you know, a trend that I saw with the first kind of pool that we built is a lot of those mentors were doing business mentoring. We're all coming, also learning how to be coaches. So, in fact, I think in the first sort of 15 people that we had, about five or six of them had, both, had taken part in this coaching uh, certification where they learned how to be coaches. So, they brought that element to that business mentoring engagement uh, that allowed them to connect better with the entrepreneurs and you know focus. But I think we are quite. I think in, as an innovator, we kind of made a switch from. Is it the entrepreneur or is it the enterprise? 
And that's a question I think many of you will. And uh, when you approach it, if it's the enterprise, then there is a certain way that you would approach any of us. It's not just an enterprise. And if the goal is to help grow the business, then you know your investment and your mentoring relationship is really focused on that. But truly, in a realistic term, you cannot separate the two. We, for a long time, had our mentors come, and then we would have entrepreneurs pitch to investors within one or two or three days of sitting down with our mentor. It doesn't seem like a big issue. But what happened was, mentorship is inherently disoriented, or it can be disoriented. A mentor sits down with you, and they challenge your assumptions, and they pull back the layers of the onion, and they say, actually, maybe you need to think about going left and not right. Maybe you need to think about reevaluating these fundamental assumptions. And so mentorship, I think, at its most productive form, is deconstructive. It's deconstructing an entrepreneur down so they hit solid ground, and then on solid ground they can rebuild their venture with greater heights than they would otherwise be able to without that mentorship. When you deconstruct an entrepreneur and then ask them to pitch a day or two after they've been deconstructed, those pitches to investors are not very good. They're confused. And so what we have found is that actually in our curriculum, we deconstruct an entrepreneur and then we reconstruct them over time. That actually there is a descent that happens via mentorship. And so if you are, thought, this goes back to our conversation this morning about curriculum. Curriculum is as much about how it is sequenced and spaced as it is about the content itself. So you need to be thoughtful stewards of the experience of your curriculum over the course of your accelerator program. And the same is true with mentorship. If you know that you have a hard-hitting mentor who's going to rip an entrepreneur apart, and that mentor sits down with an entrepreneur two days before they're pitched to all these investors, <laughs> you are not doing a service to that entrepreneur. And this gets to this another sort of case study for the group. What happens? When an entrepreneur comes back to you and says, okay, I spoke with Manita, she says go left. <laughs> I spoke with Avery, she says go right. Yeah, Ian good. tells me to stop and start a new business. Like, <laughs> how do you deal with mentor whiplash? Again, it's not you're not part of the mentor-entrepreneur relationship. You are outside of that relationship. Maybe you're building a container for it. How do you build, how do you deal with mentor whiplash? For an entrepreneur who comes to you and says, wow, I am now lost. What do you do? This has happened to a few entrepreneurs like, I don't even know if I should keep going or not. Like, I'm just like, <laughs> you know, why well, just go back into banking? What do I do? I think then the question really as intermediaries and incubators is that what is the role that we are playing? I'm just taking it back to the entrepreneur level. But I think one of the things that we do as part of that training and onboarding mentors is really ensuring that the mentors that we are engaging is that letting them know that they are not running the company. If they want to run their company, that is a separate role and that's what they should do. But their role as a mentor is to be that sounding board, uh, to be, to listen um, and to you know help the entrepreneur synthesize a lot of the different options that they have. Um, and that I think, you know, and, and bringing that as a core value of the mentor and mentoring. Um, and of course, I mean, or ultimately comes down to the personality of the person. But that's something that we, as you know, the sort of third party observers to that relationship, is something constantly watching out for. It is a mentor deciding for the entrepreneur. I think we discussed a little bit earlier around the motivation for mentorship. I think part of the key thing is to understand when you're selecting a mentor pool, that the motivations are aligned. Because they actually want to be helpful to the venture or maybe not looking to profit from the venture. If, if we're seeing that mentors are looking to get in for reasons of their reputation or of, of financial gain, it's probably not a good fit. And so you, as a gatekeeper to a mentor pool, have to be thoughtful about how you're selecting the right mentors to make sure there's a, at least alignment in terms of the type of program that you're running. Um, what we find, if a mentor comes in and all of a sudden it seems that they're looking to profit from a venture, probably is not the right, the right fit, at least in terms of our Engagement. And one of the things that I see, for example, in the Philippines, which is a small ecosystem, it's a reputation slash cool slash I want to be a star in the ecosystem 
that is a big young ecosystem. I think this is uh, something that you know we have to watch out for. These people are creating their career is to be a mentor to startup. Uh, with or without the expertise or the you know, qualities that we were talking about. Uh, and I see that a lot, uh, you know, they're just there for the glory and the celebrity status because in a small ecosystem, everybody is highly visible, right? If there are five startup uh, competitions and find there in all five, that means I am the star mentor of the things and I see that a lot. And I think uh, in smaller ecosystems, this is going to be, uh, so really, I, when even if people are approaching me five times, I'm really probing and I'm trying to understand why. Uh, and, and, and they need to convince me that their motivation is not to become a celebrity in the startup scene. Because uh, in smaller ecosystems, there are young ecosystems where there isn't yet, there are multiple intermediaries, there are only a few, there are only a few opportunities. And everybody who is working with startups is really cool and famous. Uh, it's a big, big risk. Uh, so probing quite hard, engaging with them, you know, as not in the mental relationship, but in other ways, to really understand, I think it's a better way to go rather than bringing and testing as a mentor. Back to whiplash for one second, mental whiplash. Is this whiplash? Yeah, the same question. Like three mentor talking yeah. three directions. So I think that, you know, as an adult, we make our own sense. So basically, if the first mentor tells you to turn right, you ask him why should turn right, should turn right. The same with the other two, and you make sense for yourself. Which yeah. seems the best for you. So you can even tell the first mentor who tended to turn right that if it's a leg, it's the, the good things that the third one tells you to see how he defend his his advice to you. And then the three people have different defenses, and then you can see this sounds. I think that's that's good advice. Like I think that as you're coaching your entrepreneurs and your cohort, that's good. If they come to you and say, I'm lost, I'm confused, this person's telling me to go here, this one go here, coaching them through what you just mentioned is really wise. I'll just share one quick story about what's work, what's happened with one of our entrepreneurs. So one of our entrepreneurs was from Italy, um, and he came to the program. He's very suspicious of mentorship. <laughs> uh, was not convinced it was going to be valuable for him. He met a number of mentors over the course of the program, and then um, they got they told him to go all different types of directions. And he said, "Okay, you know what I'm going to do? I want to have them." come together and fight it out amongst themselves. <laughs> so he, as an Italian, cooked a big Italian dinner, <laughs> brought around six mentors around the table, said, look, I have received this differing advice over the course of the last couple of weeks from each of you. I'm confused about the direction of the business going forward, and I want to stress test the advice that I'm giving you up for you all to Fight it out together. He then pulls his chair back from the table. I was at the table watching this whole thing happen. He pulls his chair back from the table. The mentors then begin to go at it. Their opinions get tempered. Yeah. Because actually, when they're sitting down one on one, they're saying, you've got to scale through this approach. Mm -hmm. And they're really convinced yeah. of their opinion because they're so smart. And they're like, <laughs> really great. But actually, when they get to stress test with other mentors, they create a mini board, but a night. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And so I think it's it's helpful if you can do that. This yeah. week, <laughs> you are dealing with mental whiplash amongst us. Pull us aside over lunch and say, okay, Keith is telling me to go right, Banks is telling me to go left. Let's actually have a conversation about what's the best course of action because that's going to actually help you understand the ways that the assumptions that we're bringing into our own advice. So uh, that was a, a thing that we saw. Thanks, I love that you mentioned that because that is the core of our information model. Well, I'm for you to get a quick summary of why it's our diagnosis. I think the whiplash thing is, I think it's a perfect, great point that you raised. I think it happens all the way. What we've done is, we're not assuming that it'll happen in, as a one-off meeting. We assume that it happens all the time during the incubation process and for all the companies. However good the entrepreneur is. So we've actually institutionalized that, that and we have something called a diagnostic and solutioning panel. So all these mentors who have been advising them are brought together once every three weeks, which is a mini board, and then strategy is thought. Right? So then this, this guy who is actually a financial expert who says, hey, pivot this way, is challenged by the marketing guy who says that customer segment doesn't make sense at all. 
right? So I think that as a process, bringing it into your incubation model uh, as a part and parcel of your incubation process, I think is very, very. So how do we then basically, you know, I think the end is how are we empowering the entrepreneurs to actually synthesize all of the beliefs and um, different things that they're getting and help them make that decision? Because ultimately, it has to be their decision, not us, not the mentors. Yeah. But and, we, and I think you know the core of incubation is really how we giving them all of the different to make that company succeed. Actually related to the one on the screen, how do you measure or do you track? Or do you have any framework for uh, measuring? So like, how many times do they meet? I think I'll be honest. I think we have a pretty unnuanced approach. We just ask them, how many times have you been meeting with so and so? And there's you now there's like this technology software crap that's out there where it's like you can actually have mentors and entrepreneurs engage over a platform and then track <laughs> how many times the engagements happen and you're kind of watching the whole thing from a bird's eye view. We don't do that because it just feels outside the norm of what human relationships look like. But we're actually just following up. We just literally follow up and say, okay, you met with this mentor. How many times did you engage? How valuable was it? And just trying to get feedback from a direct primary source, which is both the entrepreneur and the mentor. Take some time to do that. I think we're probably more efficient ways. I don't know exactly if people might have some better ideas, but that's what we do. I think a couple of two or three ways. I think the core of it is really that. I think one change that we made once we you know were more intentional about mentoring is that there is one person in the integration and investment team that is responsible for mentoring. Um, and that means that you know we're working with the portfolio team, understanding what the entrepreneurs are working with the mentors, and being actually the facilitator of that. Um, which means also making sure that feedback is regular. So every few months, actually getting feedback because you know our mentor engagement is not long. Getting feedback from both the entrepreneur and the mentor on what's working, what's not working, um, and synthesizing all of that feedback, um, and getting also reflection from the portfolio manager who's you know engaging. Uh, with the enterprise and kind of synthesizing that information. I think that feedback is so critical from both um, and being sort of the the server of that feedback and see. And patterns emerge fairly quickly, you know, um, and uh, as we become more tuned to that feedback. Um, but I think the important thing is to make sure that it's, it's regular and you're doing something about feedback. So there is something, so something to say that there is an action that happens after that feedback. And when we are seeing, and I think what I learned through three years of actually being a part of observing those relationships is that very soon after year one of observing those in year two, so there's, there are certain trends that I already know that this is going to be a problem in three months or in two months. Uh, because ultimately, it's really about people. And it's just about relationships. Uh, and it's really becoming quite sensitive and open about how that works out. So how to understand the idea of mentoring is important for the organization wide. So for example, uh, the first time founders come to me is only two people, right? Two co-founders, they're eager to learn and they want to accept the of mentors. But after six months, they grow up into like uh, 20 people. And when they hire and board the C-level, for example, the CTO and chief product and chief finance officer, uh, me as an incubator also want to see those kind of habits are implemented to the C-levels. As you understand, that we as incubators are only the mediators, and that we cannot force the C level because it will, you know, uh, at level the CEOs. But because we understand that mentorship can propel the growth of knowledge, how do we inside the idea of um, you know, mentoring not to only the uh, profound level, but only to the team levels? Do you have the capacity to do that? Do you have the capacity to extend mentorship down the org chart? Yeah. You do? Informally. Um, informally. Yeah, I guess like they trust us. Maybe I can give an example of what I'm doing. Uh, so one of my portfolio companies in the Philippines has grown. When I met them, they were 10. Today they are 75 uh, over the last two years. Um, and the first year of my engagement with them, I was meeting with the CEO every week. Every week was one strategic. But I think the, now the biggest problem is the team has grown too fast. Um, and there are too many, too many issues people management. So actually now I have cut down my engagement with the CEO who is really high vision has brought here a very good management team which I was part of doing together. I do that only once a month and I actually spend uh, you know two meetings in a month with 
one of their key teams because that's the team that's working with us. But I'm able to do that because that is relevant to the growth of the company and it's really most important right now to provide that advice. But what I've advised the entrepreneur to do is actually provide mentors to their teams externally because I personally cannot have uh, bandwidth to go. Uh, so maybe one of the ways, you know, maybe for some of the others is actually to encourage them to find mentors for their teammates, right? That needs to be part of their work culture. I don't think we can solve all of the mentoring needs, but actually helping them come up with processes within their teams that we are not going to present. There, there will be other advice in the ecosystem who could mentor those teams. So if it's a sales team or if it's an impact team, uh, you know, it's a customer support team. They could have external mentors for the team. That might be one way. I have, I have one last question for the group as a case study, which is you recruit an amazing mentor that you really are excited about. That mentor shows up. They're feeling underutilized mm -hmm. in your program. You have a, an entrepreneur who has some available time, and you feel like, oh my gosh. That entrepreneur might not be a perfect fit to sit down with that mentor, but I really want to make sure the mentor feels utilized. I almost will like prostitute out the entrepreneur to make the mentor feel utilized. How do you deal with this tension between what's best for the mentor and what's best for the entrepreneur? As an accelerator program, we sit at the intersection of mentorship, entrepreneurship, investors. We are at the crossroads of important people doing important work, and each of them plays an important role in impact. But when those tensions begin to conflict, when what's best for the mentor is not best for the entrepreneur, when what's best for the investor is not best for the entrepreneur, where do you fall? You have, you have to do something. Um, I think especially as an Asian woman, you have, you're so used to ignoring that behavior from men, because you expect that to be. I've not had a very bad experience, so I didn't think it was so bad, but I did have a mentor who apparently was going through a divorce or whatever, uh, started drunk, called me, but initially I didn't realize it was drunk, so I just thought it. And he would call to complain very severely about the entrepreneur and other people. Yeah, and a couple of times, the first couple of times that he did do that, I did, uh, it definitely sounded like it was wrong. And I never actually discussed it. Uh, but then I realized that he had shown up for meetings with the entrepreneur, also drunk, um, and I realized that oh, because if I had not ignored these couple of points, and then you know it was one of those things because he was a fairly big guy in that region and was a great person to bring out the dentist. It was a little bit difficult to get out of that because it was a very important person who could who actually attracted very other good mentors for us. Put the entrepreneur in the driver's seat when it comes to mentorship, and that any issues that you will encounter. Uh, or a lot of issues, the vast majority of issues that you'll encounter when it comes to uh, mental relationships can be addressed by equipping and empowering the entrepreneur to take leadership in that relationship. And so sometimes it's less about anything other than teaching and coaching the entrepreneurs to be leaders in a mental relationship. And if you do that, then you are empowering an agent to then be responsible for that relationship. So that's, if you take one thing, or at least on charted side, it's, it's to focus on empowering the entrepreneur as opposed to inserting yourself into that relationship as a third wheel. Um, so that's what I would suggest. I think uh, for those of us in ecosystems where it's been difficult to find mentors, um, I think the way to do it is to engage one or two good people, build that relationship really strong because the, the network and the referral effect is so powerful. So if you can't find like hundreds of people that you want, start with a small pool, build relationship, demonstrate that there's value for both the entrepreneur and the mentor, and that will unlock the mentors. And this we found very hard to find mentors, uh, rock up all of this, is that we've actually uh, tried to get mentors, people who build the same companies, for example, in India, to mentor the entrepreneurs in the Philippines, because these models have already been done. So, and one call just changes everything because they can just tell you what all the problems are going to show up. So maybe there's a way for us in this community to make that happen because a lot of us in small ecosystems are struggling to find important yeah. mentors, but there are successful entrepreneurs who actually want to give back. And that could be maybe one of the things that could come out of this, this idea. Thank you so much, Michelle.